the lab is um, interested in basically in cell cycle <coughs> events, in the control of cell cycle. And uh, in the most recent years, we've been spending a lot of time studying the response, the cellular response to DNA damage. So what, how cells respond um, to damage to their DNA, what happens at the cell cycle, replication, et cetera. And <coughs> what I'm uh, going to show you today is some data that hopefully will convince you that, um, that will show you how cells respond to a particular kind of DNA damage, which is UV light, UV lesions. When DNA gets damaged, the cell has a way to identify the lesions. And once the lesions are found, a signaling um, cascade is triggered that we call DNA damage checkpoint. And the response to this uh, signaling cascade <coughs> is a delay in cell cycle progression, slowdown in cell cycle progression. Basically, different phases of uh, different critical transition of the cell cycle are slowed down or halted. There is an induction of all the repair mechanisms that are necessary to remove these lesions. There is a change in the transcriptional program of the cell, and this uh, is supposedly helps the cell to remove these lesions. There is also a slowdown in DNA replication because you want to avoid to replicate a damaged chromosome. And in higher eukaryotes, um, there is also induction of the apoptotic pathway. <laughs> so um, historically, the lab is a yeast lab. But in the last few years, we started moving back and forth between yeast and man. And so um, I'll show you. First, I'll show you how we build up our history, our story on um, using yeast as a model system. And then I'll show you some slides on recent results on human cells. So <coughs> this is a, a scheme of the cell cycle. And um, when DNA lesions are identified during the G1 phase of the cell cycle, the DNA damage checkpoint blocks the G1S transition. If lesions are found during S phase, there is something that we call intra-S checkpoint that slows down S phase replication. If, if um, lesions are identified during the G2 phase of the cell cycle, then there is a, the cell cycle blocks the G2M transition to prevent segregation of uh, damaged chromosomes. And these three different um, responses are very, very similar. Uh, are, they're all very similar, but there are small differences. So in order to uh, really understand how this signaling works, we need to use um, non-cycling cells. So G1 arrested cells or G2 arrested cell or M phase arrested cell actually in, in the case of yeast. And, and at that point, we can look only at this response or this response. So um, all the data that I'm going to show you today have been done in cells that are arrested mostly at the G1, in, during the G1 phase of the cell cycle. So most of the data will relate to this response here. But we know that this, the response that we see here is very, very similar to the response that we can see in mitosis. <coughs> so the question is, how cells identify UV lesions? How, uh, how cells identify lesions on the DNA and how they activate the signaling cascade. We know a lot about what happens um, in, a, in the case of double strand breaks because there's been a lot of work that's been done both in yeast and in human cells. And here I'll show you the, how this signaling cascade works. It's this very easy schematic of the signaling cascade. It's more complicated, but this is just so that you can follow the rest of the talk. Uh, unfortunately, the nomenclature in this field is terrible, <coughs> and so I put up a, just a summary there of the names of all the factors. And unfortunately, there's like genes that have the same name in yeast and, and human cells, but they do different things. And there's genes that have different names, but they do the same thing. So it's very, very complicated. I'm sorry for that. So uh, throughout the talk, I'll use mostly the yeast 
names, except when I'm talking about human cells. So <coughs> when the lesion is identified on the DNA, the first thing that happens is that two protein complexes are recruited to this lesion. And this is the ddc 2 mec one complex. This is the apical kinase, which corresponds to ATR in human cells. And it's the first kinase in the checkpoint cascade. And uh, this is the 911 complex, which is also called 911 in human cells. They are recruited independently on the lesion. And once the kinase is recruited there, it starts phosphorylating targets. And the first phosphorylation event that we can see is the phosphorylation of the DDC2 subunit. We can uh, see the phosphorylation because we can monitor the shift in an SDS bait gel. Then it phosphorylates the DC1. And again, we can see a mobility shift when this happens. The next target is RUT9 here. Phosphorylation of RUT9 causes oligomerization of the protein. And this sets up a, basically a platform for the recruitment of the downstream <coughs> kinase, which is RUT53, which would be CHECK2 in human cells. RAD53 is also primed by a phosphorylation event performed by MEC1. This triggers an autophosphorylation cycle that activates the kinase. And we can see the active kinase is really a, shows a huge shift by mobility shift. And once this kinase is hyperphosphorylated, it leaves the RAD9 platform and goes around finding uh, downstream targets. So we uh, we can actually monitor the whole signaling cascade by looking at the st phosphorylation status of the different players here. And once we get hyperphosphorylation of RAT53, we interpret this as a sign that the checkpoint is fully active. So <coughs> we know that after double strain break, the first thing that happens is that repair proteins are recruited at the double strain breaks. The double strand break is processed to generate single-stranded DNA filaments, which are quite long. And these single-stranded DNA filaments are rapidly covered by a single-stranded DNA binding protein, RPA, that most of you probably know. <coughs> and um, this is the structure that recruits the apical kinase, the checkpoint factors. So it's not the lesion, it's not the double strand break itself. It's a product of its processing that is required to load the checkpoint factors. So what we started wondering is what, what's going on with UV lesions? What happens at UV lesion sites? So in mammalian cells, UV lesions are removed by nucleotide excision repair. That's the only repair pathway that can take care of um, UV lesions in mammalian cells. And nucleotide excision repair finds the lesion, makes an incision upstream and downstream of the lesion on one strand only. And this releases a, the pointer is dying. Um, and this release releases a damaged oligo, which is about 30 nucleotide in length that goes. And the gap is refilled by DNA polymerases. This is a quite rapid process and very, very efficient. So the question that we were interested in uh, asking is how cells activate the DNA damage checkpoint after UV irradiation? Where in this response are checkpoint factors coming in? And a few years ago, <coughs> what we realized is that you need nucleotide excision repair in order to activate the checkpoint. So here, this is the, the RAD53. So remember, RAD53 is the downstream kinase, and when it's fully phosphorylated, that means that the checkpoint is fully active. <coughs> so you take wild type cells and look at RAD53. Here it is. If you treat these cells with UV, the checkpoint is activated, and uh, RAD53 is fully phosphorylated. If you do the same thing in a RAD14 mutant, which is completely defective in nucleotide excision repair, there is no activation of the kinase. So this tells us that it's not the UV lesion itself that it's triggering the signaling, but that 
nucleotide excision repair has to identify the lesion first. And we, we did a study with several different mutations, so we know also that you need to start processing these lesions. It's not enough to recognize it. You also have to remove them, start, uh, actually not remove them, start processing them. And that is required in order to activate the apical kinase, to recruit checkpoint factors. <coughs> so nucleotide excision repair factor, find the lesion and start processing them. And we also know that uh, these factors recruit checkpoint proteins in the proximity of the damage because there is a physical interaction between some checkpoint proteins and nucleotide exchange repair components. So basically you have nucleotide exchange repair protein that br increase the local concentration of checkpoint factors, then you have processing, and at that point the uh, signaling cascade can be activated. <coughs> so we started wondering though that because of the way nucleotide excision repair works. You make the incision, you remove the gap, the oligo, generate a short 30 nucleotide gap, and then refill rapidly this gap. Is, is nucleotide excision repair processing sufficient to activate the checkpoint? And the reason why we were wondering this is that since in the case of double strand break, checkpoint proteins are recruited by single-stranded DNA, basically there is no single-stranded DNA in the case of UV lesions, because the gap is very short <coughs> and it's refilled very rapidly. So there's, how do, how do uh, checkpoint factors find any single-stranded DNA to bind in the case of uh, UV lesion? So how do you generate single-stranded DNA after UV treatment? And <coughs> so is there any other activity that can generate single-stranded DNA at UV lesions? and be responsible for triggering the, the signaling cascade. And so we started thinking that nucleases might be involved. Oh, this is kind of weird. Um, so the idea was that maybe, you know, you have a lot of UV lesions on the chromosomes. These lesions are repaired, but some lesions are very, are strange. For, and we'll see what I mean by strange. And at these lesion, at these lesions, and a nuclease activity gets in, into the nucleotide excision repair processing and makes a large single-stranded DNA region. And this might be the one that is responsible for triggering the checkpoint. So we started looking at nucleases and we had a good candidate because by two hybrid we found that, nucle that um, checkpoint factors like these two interacted with XO1. So one is a nuclease that's involved in several processes um, in, um, in the cell, but uh, there's no clear role for X01 in nucleotide excision repair or in anything that's connected to UV. So we were very interested in looking at X01. So we made a mutation in X01. In yeast is very easy. And the relevant Lanes are here. This is wild type cells. After UV radiation, the checkpoint is fully activated because RAD53 is fully phosphorylated. You knock out XO1 and you lose the phosphorylation. So in this case, nucleotide excision repair is working. The lesions are removed and are repaired, but the checkpoint is not activated. So nucleotide excision repair is not enough. You need nucleotide excision repair, but there must be some downstream event that's XO1 dependent that is needed in order to activate the kinase. And it's not only the protein that you need, but you also need its nuclease activity. <coughs> These are two catalytic site mutants, and they're as dead as the deletion. So you need the nuclease activity of uh, XO1. And to convince you that this is actually significant, I'll show you here one, another experiment. So you can I told you that the, um, the checkpoint, one of the things that the checkpoint does is to delay critical cell cycle phases. One of these, uh, in this case, we're looking at the G1S transition. And um, so this is a budding profile. So yeast cells emit a bud right at the, at the beginning of S phase, when they enter into S phase. So here, this is G1. And then here, when they start going up during, at the beginning of S phase. 
and you have a wild type, an exo-1 mutant, and a bona fide checkpoint mutant. If we UV radiate these cells, you see that wild type cells delay the emission of the bud, so they stay in G1 for longer, while the checkpoint mutant is in green is here. Um, the checkpoint mutant goes into S phase without delay, and so does exo-1. So you need exo-1 in order to delay cell cycle progression. So the next question was, what is exo-1 doing? Uh, where in the checkpoint cascade does it exo-1 act? And here is just to remind you that we can answer this question by looking at the phosphorylation status of all these factors. And to make the whole thing shorter, I'll just show you where it acts right at the beginning. So if you take out exo-1, you don't have, you can't see the first phosphorylation event that we can look at, which is the phosphorylation by MEK1 of its, by, of its uh, DNA binding partner, DDC2. This is wild type cells, UV radiation, you see that DDC2 gets phosphorylated, there is no phosphorylation of DDC2 <coughs> in the exo-1 mutant. So this tells us that exo-1 activity is required to actually activate the first kinase in the cascade. So the next question was, what is X1 doing to UV damaged chromosome? And we tried to answer this question by using pulse field gel analysis. So you can easily separate all yeast chromosomes in a pulse field gel. And if you UV irradiate the cells before this uh, loading the chromosomes on the gel, what you see is that after UV irradiation, there is, it's not really stuck in the well, but there is some ma the, uh, chromosomic material that stays very close to the well, and we call this the cloud signal because it looks like a cloud very close to the well. And you can see it by ethidium bromide stain, or you can see it by sudden blot, with different uh, probes for different chromosomes, so it's not chromosome specific. But what is interesting is that what is this, uh, this, um, this material up there? So we thought, well, maybe it's single stranded <coughs> DNA. And in fact, if you treat this sample with S1 nuclease, which eliminates single stranded DNA before you load it on the gel, you lose this signal and you accumulate a smear down here. So this tells us that the material that it's, that's in the, in the cloud signal is all single-stranded DNA. And where does this single-strand DNA come from? The single-strand DNA, it's not generated by UV light. UV light doesn't, make, doesn't generate single-strand DNA. So the single-strand DNA requires the formation of this single-stranded DNA requires nucleotide excision repair because it's lost in a nucleotide excision repair mutant and requires exo-1 because it's mostly lost in an exo-1 mutant. It's not correlated anyway to um, recombination. So it's not re recombination intermediates because knocking out recombination doesn't do anything. So the, this, uh, all this suggests that once you have a UV lesion, Nucleotide repair factors find the lesion, start to process the lesion, and then exo one jumps in and generates single-stranded DNA where there was a UV lesion. And if you do a dose response curve here, increase the UV the UV dose, you see there is an increase in the single-stranded the amount of single-stranded DNA that correlates nicely with the increase in the checkpoint response, telling you that it's probably the single-stranded DNA that it's the signal responsible for the checkpoint. And if we let these cells repair their damaged chromosome, you sh you, maybe you can see it, I'm not sure, you can, I don't see it very well from here, but there is a decrease with time in the amount of uh, the cloud signal, and there is also a decrease the checkpoint switches off slowly, but it switches off. 
So now we wanted to see what kind of single-stranded DNA do we have here. We have long regions, short regions, gaps, what is this? So we got in touch with Massimo Lopez in Zurich and we did some EM on this material here. And I'm just going to show you one example here. And we could see a lot of single-stranded DNA gaps in DNA a tree, uh, in DNA from wild type cells after UV irradiation, and the statistics is here. And the single strand DNA gaps are gone if you don't have nucleotide excision repair or if you don't have XO1. So after UV irradiation doesn't do anything to this single strand, doesn't generate any more single strand DNA gaps if you don't have nucleotide excision repair or XO1. So the idea was. You have lesions, you remove the lesions, you re repair most of the sites. Okay. And some sites, something weird happened that is XO1 dependent. Just, um, single strand DNA gaps are generated, and this triggers the checkpoint. And then these gaps will be refilled. So we wanted to make sure that these gaps were refilled, and we also wanted to measure the, tr the, the track length of this, um, the, ref the, the size of the refill patch. So we started doing some combing experiment. And in this case, I don't have to explain you how combing works, but in this case, cells were arrested in G1, were UV irradiated, and then we let them repair in G1, so there's no replication going on. We let them repair in the presence of bromodeoxyuridin. And then we look at the microscope for the bromodeoxyuridine incorporation tracks. And what we see is that after UV radiation, you have a lot of BRDU incorporation, which is good. It depends on, on the UV treatment. It depends, part of it depends on XO1. You can see it here, that the signal down here, the signal is stable, but up here, the signal is lost in X01 mutant cell, which makes sense because this is regular nucleotide excision repair refilling, <coughs> short patch refilling, and this is long patch refilling that is lost because there's no long patch to refill in X01 mutant cells. And so we looked at the, uh, the tracks. You can see them here. I mean, here is a um, magnification of the, of the whole thing. You see, there's, there's a lot of these um, tracks that are nucleotide excision repair dependent, XO1 dependent, UV dependent. You can see them, uh, you do, I mean, if you used to see BRDU tracks for after in replication experiments, these are much shorter because these are short gaps, okay? <laughs> and actually, um, the, we are very close to the limit of resolution of the technique, so we can't really tell how, what is the exact size of these patches. What we know is that these are big enough to be seen by the system, so they're probably around 4 kb long, which, um, which makes this a very interesting, um, I think, at least to me, it's a very interesting finding because uh, many years ago, uh, long patch nucleotide excision repair was proposed to happen in bacteria, but there was no evidence for long patch nucleotide excision repair in eukaryotes. And I think that this is probably what the bacteri bacteria people, the microbiologists found as uh, long patch nucleotide exchange repair in bacteria. I think this is it in yeast. So as I said, most of the UV lesions are repaired normally and some lesions are repaired differently. They're, this is kind of slow. Come on. All right. Exo one gets in there, choose DNA, generate single-stranded DNA, which recruits checkpoint factors. So the question that we ask next is, what's so special about these sites that are repaired differently? Why some sites are repaired normally and some are repaired differently, are processed differently, I should say. So we thought about three different possibilities. So one possibility is that you start processing through nucleotide excision repair, and then you start to try to refill, 
but then something goes wrong during the refilling process. And if something goes wrong here, exo-1 can compete for this gap. Exo-1 is much slower than the refilling polymerase. So if the refilling polymerase is active, then this, this gets sealed. But if the refilling polymerase is stuck, then exo-1 has enough time to get in there and start showing this, this end. So when can you get something like this? One possibility is that you finish up the nucleotide pools so that the polymerase is stuck there because it doesn't have any more nucleotides to fill the gap. Another possibility is that you have so many lesions around the chromosomes that you don't have enough um, refilling factors in the cell. And some of these refilling factors may become limiting and then you end up with a stuck polymerase somewhere. And the third possibility is that there is actually a, prob a problem with the template strand and it is the problem with the template strand that stalls the refilling fork. So we w set up to test these three hypotheses. And the first hypothesis was that there's not enough nucleotides. And you can imagine that if you, have, uh, if you give cells a lot of UV, then you have a lot of refilling around uh, the nucleus. You might use up the nucleotide pools, and this um, might cause a block in the refilling uh, of some lesions. So we expect that if we um, somehow, somehow artificially increase the levels of the nucleotide pools, we should make the checkpoint respond to higher UV dose instead of lower. We should desensitize the system. So we, we did this by knocking out an inhibitor of ribonucleotide reductase. In this strain here, the nucleotide pool, pools are bigger and there is no real difference in the checkpoint response to different UV damage, different uh, doses of UV. So we don't think this is the case. The second hypothesis was that there might be some limiting factor in DNA synthesis during the DNA synthesis step. And in order to test that, we tried to increase, uh, actually to reduce the availability of a critical factors that's required for the refilling step. And the expectation was if we have less factor, then we should have more gaps that cannot be refilled. So we should have a checkpoint activation at lower dose. So we used a PCNA called sensitive mutant. And if you shift these cells, these are G1 arrested cells, again, there's no replication going on. If you shift these cells to non-permissive temperature, you inactivate PCNA, so a lot of these gaps cannot be refilled because you need PCNA to refill them. And in fact, you have activation of the checkpoint at low doses that are very low. You have a very strong activation. So the cells are much more sensitive to UV light in this assay if you knock out one of these uh, synthesis factors. We did the same experiment with a polymerase inhibitor, RSC, which is a chemical that you can dump in your cells and <laughs> inactivate or block the refilling polymerase and the results are the same. So this works. The third possibility was that maybe you, there is a problem in the template strand that stops the polymerase. So this <laughs> is something that can happen if you have clustered lesions. If you have UV lesions that are very close to each other, so that you have one lesion on, the, on, the, on one strand and a lesion very close on the other strand. At that point, nucleotide excision repair removes the first lesion and when the repair starts to refill, the polymerase starts to refill the lesion, finds a problem on the template and stops here, okay? And this is actually something that's been described many years ago in bacteria. Cluster, uh, cluster lesions that are clo actually called closely opposing UV lesions. And so we thought, well, maybe this is happening and this is why, um, this is what is responsible for checkpoint activation. And there is one piece of evidence that suggests that this is the case. So if this is the case, then you would expect that the activation of the kinase should respond to the square of the dose of the UV lesion because you need a two-hit event here. 
you need to generate one lesion here and one lesion there. And that's, in fact, this is a kinase assay at different UV doses, and we see that it goes up more or less as the square of the dose. So this tells us that in order to activate the signal, basically, is a two-hit event. So it might be a damage on the template strand and a damage on the um, other strand. So we wanted to check this, and also here we can go ahead, take a look at this with, uh, with a prediction, because if you have a damage in the template strand, then the only way this gap can be filled is by switching the polymerase, not using the, the usual repair polymerase, which is pol epsilon or pol delta, but using specialized polymerase that they are the only polymerase that can go over a lesion on the template strand. And these are the translesion DNA polymerases. So if the model is correct, what we expect is that you block the, you block the replicative polymerase here, exo one has time to enlarge the gap. If a TLS is fast enough to refill this, to go over the lesion, then you close the gap. But if you don't have TLS polymerase because you mutated them, then this gap can get bigger and you get increased checkpoint activation. And this is what we see. So we looked at uh, TLS delta mutants. These are not, they don't have any TLS polymerase. There is an increase in this mutant in the amount of single-stranded DNA that's accumulated in the cloud. And all this is dependent upon X01. And also the checkpoint is activated at a lower dose. The cells are sensitized to UV. <coughs> so the summary of this part is that in order to get the mechanism that, is re that uh, underlies the DNA damage checkpoint activation after UV radiation requires an exo one dependent step where the nuclease <coughs> generates single-stranded DNA gaps. And these single-stranded DNA gaps are probably generated by a competition mechanism between the nuclease and the refilling polymerase. And they are generated when the refilling polymerase has problems. And as I, can, I showed you, it can happen if, the refilling, uh, if a refilling factor gets limiting or if you have a problem with a template strain. And this is the signal that's responsible. So this is, is basically the, um, the model, which I don't, won't go into because I want to show you the second part, which is what happens in mammalian cells. So the, as I told you, we kind of jump back and forth between yeast and mammalian cells. We try, with yeast, it's very easy to define mechanisms because you can make mutants, you can play around with these cells a lot. And once you find a mechanism, then it's easy enough to ask yourself, is the mechanism conserved in human cells? So we started looking at human cells. And so these are cells that are taken from uh, XP patients here. <coughs> XP patients are patients that are defective in nucleotide excision repair. They can't repair UV lesions. And here it's an immunofluorescence. We're looking at checkpoint activation by um, looking for phosphorylated, what is this? Uh, this must be um, check, uh, check one phosphorylation here. So you see uh, normal cells, after UV radiation, you get check one phosphorylation here, and P53 phosphorylation here. But if you take XP cells that are defective in nucleotide excision repair, you lose this signaling. So XP cells, nuclear extreme repair cells, are deficient in responding to UV light in activating the DNA damage checkpoint, also in mammalian cells. And this is a control in this case, well, this is too complicated, let's skip it. So basically this tells you that you need nuclear extreme repair in order to activate the checkpoint. And finally, I want to thank the people that did the work. Michele was a postdoc in the lab and he's now at IFOM. Um, Fabio was a PhD student and he's now at Clare Hall. Uh, Sarah Sertic just finished her PhD and she's been working on the human part. 
Sarah Pitz is a new PhD student that we got last year in the lab. Paolo Plevani is a long time collaborator. We've been working together for many, many years. And these are the people that helped us in all this. Philippe Pazero in Montpellier for the DNA combing experiment, Massimo Lopez for the EM, and the Alan Lehman um, lab for helping us with these um, nuclear repair deficient cells. And I'm ready for questions. <laughs>